Well, hello and welcome to another Dividend Cafe. This time, I love just changing venues around on you every week, it seems. I'm actually recording in my apartment in New York City as I have to get straight to an appointment, so couldn't get into the studio this morning. The market hasn't even opened yet on Friday morning. And as promised last week, I do have a particular topic I want to address this week but it will not be all that directly connected to the kind of turmoil that uh, has been in this market week. Um, I, as I'm recording here Friday morning, pre-market market was down 1,400 points on the week. It looks like it's set to open uh, 200, 250 points this morning, but you know how, how that goes. Um, but it was you know down significantly the week before as well. And so you're you're looking at a, a three thousand point drop in the market. It had prior to that been up a couple thousand points, and and so, you know, this is uh, downside pressure and a lot of volatility, and we know all those things. And and I think you know in the DC Today dot com every day I try to write about what's causing it, what we're doing, what we think about it, what to expect, and um, you know, each time the market has a period like this, there is a cause and there is particular circumstances, but also each time it happens, there is a, a kind of consistent best practice for, for investors. And, and so whether the cause of a market turmoil is a recession or is Fed tightening or is a war or, or whatever the various catalysts to market turmoil that have existed for, you know, hundreds of years, whatever the the particular catalyst may be, obviously we write every week and with DC Today every day and have built a financial advisory group around the notion of emphasizing wise investor behavior. And so we want high quality alignment in a portfolio. We want goals and tolerance and personality and psychology and the very customized parameters of how one's own portfolio ought to be constructed. We want that to take place before there are hard times, not after. We want to avoid buying into insanity. Um, and and yet, during uh, the difficulties, that the assurance of which provide the risk premium that give investors return over time, we also want to behave and understand that, in fact, downside volatility is a part of being an investor. So all that to say, I am so incredibly confident that we do those things for our clients at the Bonson Group that I do not feel the need to use downtime, downturns in the market to um, wring my own hands about what should we be uh, selling this or selling that or what have you. We want to get portfolio alignment correct to begin with. And, and then, of course, put our energy <clears throat> into holding hands of clients who themselves may not quite have the conviction and the metal that we are professionally expected to have and obligated to have. So there's the long intro to uh, what has nothing to do with today's Dividend Cafe. I brought, wrote last week about the reality of a further leg down of markets, a further systemic risk that could accompany what is right now a bear market in the S&P, or it has at least generated a lot of talk of recession. We haven't necessarily got there yet. And I brought up some of the potential culprits to kind of a, a black swan event, another catalyst to the economic contagion risk. Um, and, and, I, and I said why I do not believe that some of the things that have broadly been discussed over the last decade, European bonds, municipals. Um, I, I talked about a hedge fund imploding. We talked about the crypto space, how I didn't see those things as necessarily systemic events. And that now there's been a lot of talk around, well, it's private equity, which has grown so much and has taken on a, a certain differences in the way it's being invested in versus 20 years ago. Is that a space? And I shared why I don't believe that's the case. And I reiterate some of that in today's DividendCafe.com as well. Um, I believe that there is always risk in underlying businesses being invested in. And yet, um, not only am I convinced in the existence of an illiquidity premium, I'm also convinced in the benefit 
of illiquidity keeping people from behaving badly. So what I left you with last week is the idea that there may be this other issue lingering out there, and that issue is a massive, I mean massive growth in what some will call a shadow banking system, non-bank lenders that have taken on a significant role in being a liquidity provider, a credit provider in our economy. And so I refer to things like structured credit, which is largely backed by an underlying asset. It's lending against commercial property, uh, residential property, other asset-backed um, vehicles, whether it's pools of credit card loans, car loans, student loans. There is an asset-backed realm of structured credit that um, it, the lenders are largely private actors, pri meaning uh, hedge funds, uh, special pools or, or lenders that are formed that are not using deposit capital, bank capital, things like that. Apart from structured credit, there's been a huge explosion in cash flow based lending. Private credit against first lien positions in businesses that may not have underlying assets, maybe asset light businesses, but are cash flow heavy. And that might have been way too small for the bond market, perhaps too big for bank loans, but have a sweet spot in a kind of middle markets lending that is uh, largely securitized by the cash flows of the business. This has exploded in size, exploded in popularity and utility. It's been great for investors, great for companies that are borrowers, and frankly, great for lenders as well. So whether you're talking about syndicated loans, which often are generated by banks that are taking first lien positions um, in, in, and applying a floating rate to the credit they're extending to, to uh, businesses and then pooling those loans and often selling them off to institutional investors in the CLO space, collateralized loan obligations. Whether you're talking about those syndicated loans, whether you're talking about structured credit, which is largely asset backed, whether you're talking about private credit, which is largely cash flow backed. In all of these spaces, there is one huge thing in common, and that is they are not being lent out by the likes of your Lehman Brothers and cities and these kind of huge behemoths that we know from financial crisis. They're not commercial banks. They're not intertwined with depositor money. Um, they are therefore separated in a P&L sense from the balance sheet of the American economy. Now they are a part of the American economy. And this is sort of the, the tension. It is brand new and I am very critical of a central banker who is doing something that's never been done before and says, no, 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 this can't happen. Not because I think it will happen, but because that banker doesn't know. And I don't know either. I don't know that this interconnectedness of non-bank lenders in a downturn, that it can't become more contagious than I think. But what I am suggesting to you is that there is a benefit in non-bank lending that this is not connected directly to that engine of commercial banking activity, that hub of American economy, that the systemic risks are different. I accept that there could very well be widening credit spreads, that there could be defaults. I happen to believe there will be great recoveries if there are defaults where, where lending has been well underwritten. But nevertheless, I don't know what the tentacles of all of it could be. The argument that because of that opacity, the risk is greater, I think is fine. I think it's, it's true to the extent that it's true. We don't exactly know where all the connectedness is. However, we know that the banks are dramatically more capitalized than they were pre-crisis, that there is much less leverage in that traditional aspect of the economy, and that where there is greater risk being taken in this quote unquote shadow banking portion of the economy, I think that's where those risks should be taken. Where by the possessor of the risk, who is the possessor of the reward, that they will own the profits and the losses. This privatization of PL, I see, is a very positive thing. Now, will that interconnectedness end up leading to other slowdown, other uh, uh, halts in hiring, could it exacerbate recessionary impact? It's very possible. But I do not believe 
that that risk is in any way, shape, or form analogous to the pre-crisis risk, nor do I believe the, sh the mere sharing of numbers, like, oh, there used to be a trillion in non-bank lending and others four trillion, therefore the risk is four times higher. Uh, that kind of linear argument is illogical. It, it discounts the existence of collateral, it discounts the, discounts the existence of underwriting, it doesn't take into account that the leverage is different. The, the, the leverage that was on the traditional bank balance sheets pre-crisis was exponentially higher. And it doesn't, and it discounts the fact that the risk that one may be taking is their risk, that there is not the shared risk in the way we normally think about such contagion events. I, I know people are going to take this to say he's discounting or diminishing the possibility of a systemic event. What I'm saying is I do discount it more than some, but I acknowledge it exists. Should there be a deep enough recession and the way in which our private credit markets have underwritten the uh, extension of liquidity and credit to the American economy over the last five to 10 years, should this prove to be a deeper event than I have anticipated, then I, I will uh, stand corrected. I, I recognize it as a potential. And yet, I believe it to be a superior um, system as an arbiter of risk and reward, as a distributor of capital than other alternatives. So this is uh, the conclusion of today's Dividend Cafe which may not leave you any more satisfied than you were when you started. We do not know how all these things with the non-bank lending, a, non a shadow banking system will play out in a deeper recession. And yet I am not remotely convinced um, that we have a better alternative. I think this represents a positive evolution in American capital markets. And I think that for the most part, Deep losses being taken in a capitalistic system are painful to those who take losses, but minimizing contagion risk from those losses ought to be our objective. And I think as an investor, we're in a better position that way than we've been. That doesn't mean we can avoid losses, but what we're talking about today is trying to avoid systemic losses where one person's pain leads to another non-connected parties pain. And I do not believe we are sitting in such an environment. The recession could come, the bear market could worsen, perhaps both of those things don't even happen. We don't know. But what I do believe is that many of the sort of black swan events people are looking to are wrong. And that is generally the case. That black swans are not the things people are looking to, they're the things they don't look to which by the way, is the definition of a black swan. I need to run now um, to get to a doctor appointment. And so I'm going to leave you there. I hope you've enjoyed the podcast, enjoyed the video, and I look forward to next week's Dividend Cafe. Please uh, do reach out with any questions you have. And thank you as always for listening to and watching the Dividend Cafe.